Well, good morning, you wonderful people. It's uh, good to be in the house of the Lord together. And we're continuing our theme of Rebuild, Renew and Restore. And uh, this morning we're looking at Renewing Your Vows. Uh, renewing Your Vows. Now, uh, those of you that have been married for many years, you will know that sometimes it's good to have those renewals. Where you just remind each other of those promises. Other times it's because there's been some broken trust. And you need to renew your vows to just say, guys, we've made a mistake, but let's, let's start again. Let's start afresh. And that's really the heart behind our this morning's passage is we find at the time when Israel had an amazing covenant, an amazing relationship with God. But they messed up. And they, uh, they find themselves in this place of just once again spending time with God, spending time with God's Word, and they're reminded of the amazing covenant that God had with them. And so they get to the stage where they want to renew their vow. And that's where we get to. If you go to Bibles, you can turn to Nehemiah. Uh, in our cell group, we've been working through Nehemiah. And uh, there's an amazing section in chapter 8 of Nehemiah we looked at before where they, with the renewed covenant and they, they start the sacrifices again. So they, they're back to temple worship and they're fasting and they're praying and they're enjoying God. And then in chapter 9, we have this most amazing prayer. In fact, it's one of the longest prayers in the Bible. And the people of Israel have just spent time listening to Israel. She's read he's from the, the Bible. And it says that they had three hours of prayer and three hours of Bible study and then three hours of prayer and three hours of Bible study. And out of this is birthed this beautiful prayer in chapter 9. And, uh, and then it starts in verse 4, towards the end of verse 4, and it says, And they stood up and they blessed the Lord. And they said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all the blessing and praise. Verse 6 of chapter 9. You alone are God. You made heaven, the heavens and the earth, with all their hosts. The earth and everything in it. The seas and all that is in them. You preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. And so he starts with this beautiful prayer. And he just says, God, you are amazing. You are wonderful. You are mighty. You are the creator. And then this is beautiful. The rest of chapter 9 is a history lesson. He says, God, we remember how you took one man, Abraham, and you drew him out of the, the land of Ur, and you made covenant with him, and you said to Abraham, Abraham, from now on, you're no longer Abraham, but you're Abraham. And I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a multitude, and you're going to become the father of all nations, and in you the world will be blessed. And then he said this to him, Abraham, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And then the rest of the prayer he says, and then God took this nation of Israel and he grew them until they ended up in Egypt. And then in Egypt they were so big and they were oppressed and they cried out to their God who was in covenant with them and said, God, deliver us. And he did. Mighty signs and wonders and miracles and he brought them out of Egypt. And he walked with them in the wilderness and fed them manna water from a rock and a pillar of fire and a cloud and all these miracles. And he says, and I led them through all this and then we came to Mount Horeb. And Moses went up the mountain and God defined what it is to be in covenant with God. And then God gives Moses these rules and says, this is what it means to be a covenant people. If you will do this, I will be your God and you will be my people. And then there's a very sad voice, a verse that changes. And so he's, he's talked about all of this. But in verse 16 it says, But they, these people that were in covenant with God, but they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commands. God says, I have covenant with these people. In fact, while Moses is up on the mountain, finding out what covenant looks like, the people had already turned their back and made a golden calf. <laughs> Just a couple of weeks into this awesome covenant with God, they'd already broken it. And then the rest of chapter 9 just talks about the cycle of up and down, up and down. Until they find themselves where they are at the end of chapter 9, 
where they've just come back from captivity. And this is how sad it is. Verse 36 of chapter 9. And this is building up to chapter 10 if you want to really look at it. But chapter, chapter 30, verse 36 says this. Here we are, servants today, in the land that our God gave to our fathers to eat of its fruit and its bounty. Here we are, servants. Here's the people and they're back in Israel, but it's not their land. It belongs to Persia. And they're standing in this land saying, this could have been ours. This is the dream God had for us, a land of milk and honey, but we messed up. And now we're sitting with second choice. We have a land, but we're servants in our own land. Because we turn our back on God. We're the ones that broke covenant. And so as they're reflecting on this, and as they see where they are, they say, come on, people of Israel, it's time to reconnect with God. It's time to once again become God's covenant people. We're going to make promise to do better. And so that's where chapter 10 comes in. And so, uh, so it says there, and because of all this, verse 38, because of all of this, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests see it. And so at the end of chapter 9, they say, guys, let's make covenants and let's not make it just a promise, but let's write it down and seal it. Let's make a very sincere oath to God that we once again want to be in covenant with God. Now that's a serious pro oath that they're making. And then this this is kind of the oath that they speak about in Numbers chapter 30 verse 2. When a man makes a vow to the Lord and takes an oath to obligate himself to a pledge, he must not break his word, but do everything he said. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 4 says, When you make a promise to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. It says, if you make a promise, you make covenant with God, you better keep your part. And this is what they're doing here. The Bible contains many examples of people that made promises to God, and covenant with God, only to break it later. As we saw in Exodus 24, the, prom the people promised we will do everything the Lord has said. Six weeks later, they're making a golden calf, breaking the law. In Mark 14, 29, Peter promises Jesus, even if all fall away, I will not. Hours later, he's responding to the servant girl saying, I do not know this man you're talking about. But what we love about this chapter, chapter Nehemiah, is that even though we're the ones that fail, we're the ones that always break covenant, God is faithful. God never breaks the covenant from His side. God is a covenant promise-keeping God. And even when we don't keep our end of the deal, and sometimes we make promises to God and we don't keep them, we break our promises. Jeremiah 31 says about God's people that I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. God wants to make covenant with you this morning. He says to you, I want to be your God. I want to be your shepherd. I want to be your amazing, awesome, creating God, miracle working God. But I want you to take me serious and enter into covenant. You see, this covenant promise is a two way street. God says, I will be your God, but I want you to be my people. And so out of this comes four amazing promises in chapter 10 that the people of Israel promised God. And this isn't making new promises. They're saying these promises have always been there. But we as the nation of Israel want to recommit to those four promises. And so these four promises that we're going to look at weren't just for Israel. These are the four promises that we're making to God. Say, so God, we're renewing our promise. Just like on the day of a wedding when I said, I promise to love you and cherish you till death does depart. These four promises that they make today are for us to do. And so we're going to look at them this morning. The four promises that they made. And the first promise was they promised to submit to God's word. Chapter 10, verse 29. It says this. 
These joined with their brethren and the nobles, and they entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given to Moses, the servant of God, and to observe all and to do all the commandments that the Lord our God and His ordinances and His statutes. The first thing it says, God, we will obey your word. And you know what? We even invite you to put curses on us if we don't. Sure, that's, those are strong words. God, I'm going to do what the Bible says. And you know what? If I'm not willing to do it, you may even curse me. Can we say that? Can we take that bold stand and say, God, I will do whatever you tell me to do. I will obey your word. You see, the heart of this is saying, God, I promise to be devoted to you. That's the heart of this. Submission to God's word. They were saying, God, we want to take your word so serious. 1 Chronicles 69 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Key is devotion. We need to remember that the depth of our devotion determines our impact. God is not looking for strong people. He's not looking for great people. He's not even looking for perfect people. But He's looking for those who want to be committed. To say, God, I'm willing to enter into a relationship and fall in love with Your Word all over again. The people are saying that they are seriously submitting to God and to His Word. The second promise they make is just the next verse, verse 30. We would not give our daughters as wives to the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. If the people of the land brought wares, oh, that's the next one. So the second thing he says is, we promise to be separated. We're not going to mix anymore with those who are not in the same faith. You see, when God made covenant, part of covenant was, you are my people separated from the rest. You're my chosen treasure, my segula, my favorite Hebrew word. You're my treasure, and I don't want you to be mixed. I want a pure, holy nation. In fact, most of the laws in the Old Testament were to show them that they're separate. He says, guys, I want you to dress different. I want you to act different. I want you to eat different. Because I want people to see you as my special people. And that's what he's saying to us as he's saying to the church. He says, church, when people see us as a church, we're supposed to be different from the world. We're supposed to act different, handle trauma different, handle crises different, handle life different. Because we're separated. He says, are we willing to say, God, I promise to not be so engrossed in the world that I believe in. But I want to shine as a light. I want to be different. And I promise to be different. Separated from the world. Again, this is not to do with racism or, or prejudice. But this is about being committed to a holy walk with God. Saying, I'm going to do things God's way. We, uh, I don't know if I should say this, but I enjoy watching a so people legacy. Um, and I should be down there. But in Legacy, there's, uh, there's an interesting thing with uh, this, this little business called Brightside. And they want to do things the right way. And the challenge is that they're realizing quickly that when you want to do business in South Africa, you've got to pay bribes. You've got to pay for vacations and holidays. And this guy says, I don't want to do that. And his partner says, but everybody's doing it. It's the norm. And this guy is torn because he knows it's not the right thing to do. And that's the kind of reality that we're facing in the church. Are we willing to just do what everyone else is doing to fit in? Or are we willing to say, no, I won't. I won't pay bribes. And I won't do corruption. And I won't lie on my taxes. Because God says he's looking for a nation that are pure and holy. I don't care if society says that's the norm. I find my standing in God's word. And the people of Israel are saying, we don't care what else, everyone else is doing. And we want to do what God is saying. And He says, separate yourselves. Separation.
from the world. Don't mix with what else is out there. But we promise that we won't let our daughters marry into those pagan cultures. Because those pagan cultures was what caused us to wander from God. It was the distraction. Throughout the Old Testament, it was when they married Baal worshippers and Canaanite gods, and they allowed those gods into their homes, that soon their heart was torn. And so he said, we promise to submit to God's word. Secondly, we promise to live separated lives, holy lives. And the third promise they made was to love the Sabbath. To love the Sabbath. He says this, verse 31. If the people of the land brought wares or any grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we would not buy from them on the Sabbath day or on our holy days. And we would forego the seventh year, the seventh year's produce, and the exacting of every debt. He says, you know what, we've allowed as a nation, we've allowed Sunday to lose its appeal. We've allowed the Sabbath to become just like any other day. And he says, no, from now on we promise that we will give God His special day. We will separate that day and make it special once again to God. You see that the Sabbath was significant to God's people for various reasons. And first of all, it was a day set aside to honor God. It was distinctive from other days so that they could worship God and not be distracted by the demands of everyday life. Can you imagine the people of the city coming to you and saying, Hey, you want to buy something? Not today. It's Sunday. It's like, but what? This is God's day. We sit apart this, this time for God. The shock that it would be. But it's the norm. Everybody's selling on the Sunday. Nice. This is God's day. All the other six days of the week are for business. This is God's day. I remember growing up in primary school. We were in a small little mining town when you had to make sure you got what you needed on Saturday. Because there wasn't a single shop open. Not even the, not even the Greek cafe was open on a Sunday. And then I remember when I was in high school, Caltech's Garage was the first shop to open on a Sunday. And the people were, oh, open on a Sunday. And then very really slowly but surely the checkers opened on a Sunday. And then OK opened on a Sunday. And then Spa opened on a Sunday. And before you knew it, Sunday was just another day. Then we moved to KZN and we found school sports on a Sunday. Races, marathons, everything competing for Sunday. And so baby came up and said, what time does the one school close on Sunday? It's like Sunday, it's even open on a Sunday here yeah, KZN. Do you know there's no difference, absolutely no difference anymore between a Sunday and any other day of the week in most realms. It's just another day. We've lost this love for God to say, God, this is your special day. And the people said, we don't want this to be another day. This is God's special day. Not only was it a special day of spending worship with God, but secondly, it was important to be a day of rest. They took it very seriously. Guys, we need this rest. You know why people are so burnt out and so tired? Is we've lost the art of resting. We fill up our Sundays, we fill up our weeks, we fill up our days. We've lost the art of taking a day of just doing nothing. Just relaxing and enjoying family. Thirdly, it was also a very important day for helping others. The Sabbath day became a day where you went to help. Where you went to help those in need. And fourthly, it was a day of hearing and sharing God's truth. It was a day of witness. Not only were they to keep the Sabbath, but they were to keep the seventh year. Which meant every seventh year they stopped farming. For a whole year, they just trusted God. Oh, if we could just learn to trust God like that again. Thank God you've blessed us on the sixth year so much that that year will carry us to next year. We're not going to farm, we're not going to sell, we're not going to buy. We're going to take a Sabbath year of resting and trusting. We need to learn to trust God like that. And then, part of that seventh year was to write off debt. Sure. 
to write our debt saying, you know what we're saying? We're saying we value people more than we value things. That's what this covenant was saying. And this is what the people of Israel are saying. They're saying, you know what? People are more important than things. People are more important than things in the world. This is what they're saying. They're saying, God, we promise to love your word. We promise to be separate, holy people. And we promise to respect your day. God's day. And then they had no one more promise. And this is a beautiful one. The fourth thing they promised. Verse 32. And we made an ordinance in ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one third of a shekel. For the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, for the regular grain offering, for the regular burnt offering, for the Sabbath, the new moons, the feasts, the holy things, the sin offerings, we can turn for Israel, and all the work of the house of our God. We cast lots amongst the priests, the Levites, and the people for bringing of word and offerings to the house of our God, according to our fathers' houses, at the appointed time year by year, to the burnt offerings to the altar to the Lord our God. Listen to this in verse 35. And we made a promise, an ordinance, to bring our first fruits to our, of our ground and our first fruits to all of our, all our trees year by year to the house of the Lord. To bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the Lord. To bring the first of our herds and our flocks to the house of our God. To the priests who minister in the house of our God. To bring the first fruits of our dough offerings fruit to all kinds of trees, the new wine and the oil, to the priests, to the storehome, to the storerooms of the house of our God. And then he comes to all the other offerings, and I'm going to just wrap it up, verse 39. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offerings of grain and new wine and oil and to the treasuries, where the priests who minister and gatekeepers and singers are. And this is the, the summary of all. And we promise that we will not neglect the house of our God. He says, we promise that we will love God, we promise to submit to Him, we promise to keep His days separate, we promise to support God's work. We promise to look after the priests, the Levites, we promise to look after God's house. Because we realize that this is a covenant that we're making with God. They promised to support God's work. The temple in Jerusalem stood at the heart of the country's religious, moral, and spiritual life. And they said, we promise to take care of that. And so these are the four promises, really, that they weren't making new promises. They're saying, this is what we were supposed to do all along. And we want to recommit ourselves to doing these things. We submit to God. By doing that, we're saying, God, we want you to be the pilot of our life. We submit and we promise that we will live separate holy lives. Because we want to spend time with God. We promise that we will keep His day special. We promise to rest. And we promise to take care of God's house. Those are the four things they said. These are the things we promise. And those are the four things that we say, Lord, we want to renew our promises to do those things this morning. Let's stand together as we commit to these things. Father, as your people stood in that city, as they spent time in your word and just reminded themselves of the covenant that you made with them, we thank you that we're living in the new covenant. A covenant that was broken through the precious blood that Jesus was put out. That by God's grace we stand in a relationship with our loving Father. And Lord, even though we don't keep law, we thank you that these promises we can make to you this morning. We promise to submit to you. We want you to be our king. We want you to be the one who rules and reigns over our life. And we want to say, Lord, what do you tell us to do? We want to do. We promise this morning that we want to not fall in love with the world or the things of the world. But we want to fall in love once again with the things of our God and the priorities of our Father. Father, we thank you and we want to promise that we want to keep a special time set apart for you. 
We want that one day a week, whether it's Sunday or Saturday or Friday, or, but we want to set apart a part of our week that is your special time. We want to rest in you. And Father, we promise that we will take care of your church and your church family. We promise to be there for one another, to encourage and strengthen and support one another. Because this is your body, your family. And Father, as we renew our covenant, as we renew our promises, we thank you that you said that when we commit and we keep our side of the promises, that your blessings will bless us to overflow. And so Lord, we recommit, we re-promise, we renew our promises to you this morning. If you will be our God, we will be your people. Help us to do that this morning, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We worship you, Lord, come up.